getting straight, similar to Psych Out, was really about the counterculture and uh, a lot of the protests that were going on on college campuses. Right. And in the film, there are reenactments of those protests. Uh, with yes, we had, sort of we had some of good college protests in that. There was good stuff. Uh, it was very powerful with beautiful young girls getting their heads cracked open and so on by nasty cops with clubs. And uh, it was a very powerful, daring picture about student rebellion. Well, the picture really wasn't about that. It was about a young man trying to get his master's degree under the adversity of a uh, traditional, traditional habit-bound uh, faculty. Yeah, and then yeah. sort of clashing with um, the people around him who were yes. very zealous about, about protesting a, a, social issues and. Uh, well, yeah. With the teachers, it was an old school thing that he was fighting. With the students, he had been there. He was an old rebel who had then gone off to war, had been drafted, and then came back. And he wasn't as interested in the protests, but they kept dragging him in because he had a, a very strong leader's personality. And um, I had first turned down the picture when they offered it to me. And then I said, look, I have a slant on it. I would like to play this story against current events, the college rebellion, since it takes place in a college that's not very far-fetched. So they went for it. And so it turned into a picture about college rebellion during the time of the Vietnam War. And uh, therefore, it was one of the first to basically make that statement. And then opened on the day of the Kent State Massacre. So it was predicting <laughs> the future rather strongly in the picture. But it's hard to o open a comedy about rebellion on the day of the Kent State Massacre. So there was uh, an immediate uproar and conflict about it in the press, which wasn't to our disadvantage. It was Columbia's top grocer that year. Wow. And, uh, and by having that film be so successful, um, I believe that's when the beginnings of the development of the stuntman uh, were rumbling. I guess the book was owned by Columbia Pictures right. at that time. And they offered it to me as a follow-up, as my next picture. And again, I had a big problem with it. Uh, the, uh, the book was written by a guy named Paul Brodeur. Uh, a, a film critic, and it had uh, a very successful publication in several countries, and I was told by the head of the studio that there were two very important directors who wanted to make it, and that of course was a lure and a temptation. And, uh, and when I read it, there was a irresistible metaphor in the picture about illusion and reality. A good, strong clothesline to hang some thematic laundry out to dry. But uh, the book, I thought, made a mistake, at least in my terms. Uh, the leading characters were all crazy. It's an easy out when because of crazy people, you don't have to motivate. You don't have to worry about why they're doing things. So I kept coming back to it in my mind. And I decided I could explore illusion and reality thematically in the picture, the idea of a fugitive hiding his identity by posing as a stuntman, completely unfamiliar with his surroundings. He, and, and encouraged to do very dangerous stunts. He starts becoming paranoid and, be and begins to believe the director of the film is trying to kill him. And it seemed like a, a good vehicle for that exploration. And I, I wrote a treatment, like a 150-page treatment, 
exploring that idea and gave it to the studio and they said, I said, if you let me rewrite the screenplay this way, I'll make it. And they said yes. And I hired Larry Marcus to do the screenplay with me. And uh, I was in love with it when we finished and offered it to the studio. And they weren't as enthusiastic as I was. They kept giving me long lists of absurd notes mm. <laughs> that I became fed up enough with to where I wrote a 30-page essay about the notes and said, no soap on the picture. And I took it on turnaround. My agent assuring me, Dick will have a deal at another studio inside of a month, I promise. Inside of a month, we've been turned down by every other studio in town. Wow. And uh, therefore, it took 10 years from script to screen mm. to get that picture made. But it was worth it when it did get made for me. It was Mel Simon. He was the financier on the film, an independent financier. He was a shopping mall magnet. It was this who had just gotten into film, started a film company. And uh, I went to pitch him in New York. I was tipped off that he might be interested. And uh, somebody made the connection for me. And the pitch was going very good. But I ran out of time, and so I hitchhiked a ride with him in his jet, and we were flying and talking, and I was riding backwards over Providence, Rhode Island, when the deal closed, and it stuck. Uh, it was amazing. Um, I can't tell you how many meetings I've had at the Polo Lounge where two guys sit across the table from each other, each claiming to have both of the money, half the money, and both of us are lying. <laughs> and here was a man with all the money who said yes. Although, unfortunately, it was two years before we actually got the money from him to do it. But during those two years, there was a lot of wiggling and squirming and hiring actors and finding locations and doing the preparations that you should do in three months. Do you always have in mind to have Peter O'Toole as the director of like Cross? Peter is, uh, was my favorite actor. If I had a name, the best performance I'd ever seen on the screen it would probably be Peter in Beckett. And I desperately wanted him to play my favorite character that I ever had ever written. And yes, I very much wanted him. Although, uh, at the time, amazingly, he wasn't as bankable as he should have been. So there were people objecting. <laughs> but, but once I met him and he said yes, which was quite a story in itself, uh, which I'll tell you if you like. Oh, definitely, that would be yeah. great. Okay, well, once it happened, I could never give it up. You know, it had to be Peter or nothing. Uh, a guy came to me one day and said, uh, a buddy who said, I know you're, you really want Peter O'Toole for your movie, The Stuntman. And uh, he's coming to a party at a friend's house. Would you like to get me to get you invited? And I said, hell yes. <laughs> and he did. And I went to the party and Peter was there doing somersaults with his friend, uh. and uh, I got acquainted with him, and we talked for a good part of the evening, mostly small talk, and I never got up the courage to mention the stuntman. Mm -hmm. He's my favorite actor, and I didn't want to offend him by, by talking business at a party. And when he left, I was kicking myself, and you asshole, you chicken shit, how could you not approach him with it? And then fate, I guess, got upset about it, and the guy he was with told him outside that that guy you were talking to has made some interesting films, including one called Freebie and the Bean. And 
Fate was really playing tricks that day mm. because Peter had just broken up with his woman and she had left him a note that said, by the way, there's a picture that was just made for you. It's called Free Me and the Bean. Ah. It starts with a cat pissing in a dustbin, meaning a garbage can, and uh, there are two crooked policemen who are rummaging through it, and it gets progressively worse, and there's lots of phony blood. And he said, uh, uh, Peter came back in, and he said, did you direct Phoebe and the Bean? And I said, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, I like that picture very much. And I said, I've got a screenplay for you. <laughs> and he took it to London and uh, called me a couple of weeks later. And he said, I indelibly remember, he said, Richard, I am an intelligent, literate man. If you don't let me play the part, I will kill you. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> I figured that's about the best response I could possibly get. Then the, the lead, the fugitive, Steve Railsback. Right. Uh, was that a bit of a search to find him? Uh, it was. Because he was a very unique person at the time. He hadn't really been a right. in any other film. Actually, his agent did a brilliant job. He knew my weak points. <laughs> uh, and uh, he was, Steve was a protege of Ilya Kazan, mm. who I have enormous respect for. Mm. And, uh, was he at the actor's studio, Steve Rosebach? Yeah. Okay. He heavily into the actor's studio, and, and he had starred in a minor picture, small picture, for Kazan. His agent gave him the script for me, and he called me up and said, I've read it. I said, would you like to come to the house and talk? And he did. And he was sitting there, and I was sitting there, and I asked him if he wanted to read, and we read together. And... Uh, I was stunned at the depth with which he worked and the chances he was willing to take. He was kind of a crazy West Texas kid with his head shaved off because he had just had a shave for doing Manson. Nobody had seen any footage of that yet because it was in the editing room. But uh, after working with him for 15 or 20 minutes, I said to him uh, impulsively, your camera, and that stuck. He played the part. I think the location having at that at the hotel Coronado in San Diego really added a lot to it. Were all the stunts really done on the hotel itself? Yeah. Wow. It was really. Was that yeah. difficult to get permission from the hotel to allow you know because those people were jumping off the hotel and well, doing so? Well, I think they that. probably didn't bargain <laughs> for the extent we would go to, but uh, Pauline Kale, who was the goddess. At, Critic, world critics at that point said, if there is such a thing as a masterpiece of a location, this is it. And I did nearly give it up because it was covered with palm trees. And in my mind, this was an austere European location. Mm. And I couldn't see where all this tropical foliage fit. And then I figured out that that wasn't my problem. That was Peter O'Toole's problem. Because I was making a contemporary picture where you could see palm trees and parking lots or anything you wanted to. He was making a period piece that supposedly was in Europe during World War I and the movie within the movie, and he couldn't show the palm trees in his movie. So I, I turned that problem over to him and I, I wrote a little scene which he delivered in his brilliant in. Uh, innovative style uh, where he's screaming about palm trees, palm trees, everywhere you look there are palm trees and he's riding around in his uh, uh, magic machine uh, the, the, and the, crane. The, the basket hunt from yeah, the crane, yeah. yeah and he swoops down on the actors and complaining about the palm trees and it's a wonderful ex scene that explains the dilemma and gets rid of it and it allowed me to use the location. Did Peter O'Toole ever talk to you about uh, what director may have inspired his performance, or was it really something that he kind of came up with? Uh, I mean, was he, do you think he was trying to impersonate someone in particular? Another he, director? Or? 
he says it was the summation of his experience. Mm. Uh, uh, and I'm sure that whatever he was saying was true. Uh, but uh, one would immediately suspect that it would be uh, the director of Lawrence of Arabia. And some of the actors said it was me, and I think what Peter said was the truth, that he was really doing a spy. It was really Peter, spontaneously as he was going along. And uh, you know, it was an incredible film, and you ended up being nominated for uh, Best Director at the Academy Awards and also for uh, Adapted Screenplay. Right. Uh, did that uh, take you by surprise, the, the critical praise that the film got when it came out, or were you sort of... Frankly, I would or? have been very disappointed <laughs> if it hadn't received it, because I thought it was the best fucking thing that anybody ever did at the <laughs> but, uh, but after... Ten years of rejection mm. and criticism. Yeah. I must say, it was refreshing. Uh, after the stuntman was uh, released and you got the, you know, you got the Academy Award nominations and there was so much praise. Did you feel that um, you had a lot of freedom to go on to make another project, or were you still sort of fighting the same fight to get a movie made that you had always been? I found out over the years that it never really gets easier. Mm -hmm. That a director is suspect. If there's something he wants to do, it, he's immediately under suspicion. He wants it. Because studios are used to tricking directors into doing the things they want. They fight to convince them to do the pictures they want. And if you do the pictures they want, they're very cooperative. And that's a good way to build a career. I never learned how to do that. So I couldn't take advantage of that phenomenon. I always wanted to make the pictures that I was involved with or wanted to make for my own reasons. And so I wasn't as useful to them as you would be normally. And therefore, I was under suspicion. He wants to make a picture? Why? What's his ulterior motive? Mm -hmm. And I've, most of the major directors I've spoken to have a pet project that they can't get done at the studios. Mm. Corelco, the studio, who I had had a relationship with, uh, asked me to do the movie. And again, it was a trade. They were willing to do a picture I wanted to do, which was um, The Fat Lady. If I would do Color of Night. They had Bruce Willis attached, and actually the head of William Morris, which is the agency that handled Bruce Willis, was a co-producer on the picture. And um, I agreed to do it if I could do the rewrite I wanted, and I did an extensive rewrite. Uh, and because this, what interested me in it was it was a, a therapy group and my brother is a psychoanalyst and so there was a certain amount of background in my life relating to that subject matter and uh, Everybody in the group was in love with and banging the same girl. But nobody else knew it. Yeah. About it. Everybody thought it was their girl. Mm. And that's what we had going in uh, Color of Night. And uh, it was a complex psychological story, psychological comedy really comedy murder story and uh, uh, that hit an unfortunate turn of events. The turn of events was we cut it on a machine, an editing machine, that was so interesting and so, so much fun to use 
It was the ending machine that had a shark running around and anything you wanted to get rid of, the shark would eat it for you. You push a button, the shark would gobble it up. It was half pinball machine, half editing machine. Oh, this was a uh, digital? Editing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, everybody wanted to have a cut in that. Uh -huh. And the producer, I had a deal with the producer that if he ever wanted to, didn't agree with my cut of the film, normally I would get final cut, but he said he couldn't give it to me in this case because of his deal with the studio. But we made an arrangement where if he wanted to challenge my cut, he could make a cut. We would have identical previews in the same city, uh, same theater, and the winning numbers would be the final cut. He wanted to play, and he did his cut. And we had the previews. And I won. So he fired me. <laughs> I went to the director's guild and they said, you can't fire a director in this, in this situation. It's just not part of the contract. So we went to arbitration. I had the reputation because I had been a publicity man as a kid in that advertising agency of being a good publicity man. And I had a better reputation than I really deserved, but he hired the best publicity man in the business, a really high-powered guy, and launched a publicity campaign against me that weekend, mm -hmm. attacking me in the press. He had several key columnists and articles in the various papers. And you always do that start a publicity war on a Friday yeah. because then you can't get answered till Monday. Yeah. Yeah. And so that weekend I was busy writing the rebuttals that I had planned for the Monday paper when I had a heart attack. And I realized I can't win this from a hospital bed while I was in the hospital bed that I'm not going to win this publicity war or the, this cut. Uh, but I did learn a true lesson, the true meaning of final cut. It's the one they make in your chest during the bypass surgery. <laughs> <laughs> I went into him and I said, look, I'm going to take my name off the picture. I was lying because you can't really desert your cast and leave them holding the bag. He had done a terrible cut of the picture. Mm. He had destroyed it. Uh, I do scenes like shaggy dog stories. They're jokes with a punchline at the end. Mm. He had gone along and called a, cut all the punchlines out. So it was just one big shaggy dog story <laughs> without a punchline. And uh, I said to him, I will leave my name on the picture if you give me the European cut and, and the uh, uh, video cut in yeah. my version. And he said, I can't give you European because it's opening day and date, it's too late, but I'll give you the video. So I said, okay, it's the only thing I could get at that point. So I recut the picture because they had destroyed my cut. and had to get the code seal on it again and so on. And that was released in my version in on the video, mm -hmm. which is a good film, but it had already been reviewed badly as a movie. I took it to the three key critics I could find, New York, and Chicago, and I've forgotten where else, in London, and got them to re-review the picture in my version. And they all gave it rave reviews, mm. which gave me the satisfaction of saying, see, I was right. It didn't mean anything. The, the world didn't know anything about it, you know. Mm. I think it is to create a world, populate it, and blow life into it. That the director makes three pictures, or a filmmaker makes three pictures. The one he writes, the one he shoots, and the one he edits. And they had better be three different pictures. Mm. He has to contribute seriously to each one and hopefully it takes on a new complexion because each medium offers new possibilities and if it's a really good picture it will have realized its potential in all three of those areas.
But I think the picture lives or dies for me on performance more than screenplay, more than visuals, more than story. Performance is the essence of the movie. What has been the, the proudest uh, moment of your career as a film director? Uh, walking towards the, out of the theater uh, after the preview, uh, after the opening of the stuntman, and hearing the audience in the background.